Hey everybody, absolutely stunning news over here this week. We have a video version of this week's episode available on our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash late night. Go over there, sign up at any tier, and you'll have access to it. Once again, that's patreon.com slash late night. Now, enjoy the show. Hey, George, first question. Excellent glasses. Thank you. Where are they from? Zlul. These were 15 bucks. Wow. Oh, I love that. Zlul.com. Aren't these killer? The Zlul is the newest one. So I have iBuyDirect. I have Zenny.com. And Zlul was this newest one. I got this and another pair like the polar opposite. They're like these big huge chunky ones like this. I love it. Yeah. It was 40 bucks for both with shipping and prescription. And that's amazing. Dude. Yeah. I'm on that with Firmu. Very similar deal. I have like six pairs of glasses and they're all from Firmu. I have, I think 31 pairs. I think I have. Oh my God. It's perfect. It's just for every occasion. It's my hairstyle basically. (laughs) (laughs) Whatever mood I'm in in the morning, it's like, oh, okay. I'm going to part my hair this way. How bad is your prescription? It's bad. Some people try my glasses on. They're just like, oh my God. Other people try. It's like, oh, not that bad. I don't walk into walls. Yeah. You know, I'm not at that point. Like when I've gone snorkeling or scuba diving or something like that, you know, I don't have a prescription mask. And so after a few hours, I forget that I don't have my glasses on. Then you put it back on. It's like, oh yeah, right, right, cool. This does raise the question, do they make prescription snorkel masks? Oh yeah. They do. Really? Yeah, they're like crazy expensive, but the whole lens is correct. Yeah, I looked into it for like two seconds once. I was like, man. If I'm going to pay that kind of money, I better be wearing that in public. Oh, totally. For performances and stuff. I think just on stage, if an entire band had prescription masks. Snorkel attached. Yeah. Feels very Devo. Very Devo. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, they had the goggles. Yes. Those are prescription too. In high school, I was a big time swimmer and I toyed with that as well of the prescription goggles. But back then in the Cretaceous, it was crazy expensive. I'm sure now you can get them for seven bucks or probably... Probably. My go-to Halloween costume for years was I bought through eBay what was originally a Club Devo, the yellow hazmat suit with the Devo. So it was like from their mail order thing in whatever the fuck, like 1981 or 79 or something. So that and a pair of swim goggles was for probably 10 years my go-to. Well, I can't think of anything else. Of course it was. The other thing is those suits are fucking hot. Oh my God, they do not breathe. Yeah, it's like a plastic bag, basically. Yeah, they don't breathe. It's a plastic bag, and you would just be boiling hot even in the fall. I wore a wetsuit for a Halloween gig once, and yeah, talk about not breathing. Oh boy. <laughs> what was the costume with the wetsuit? I'm like, I couldn't think of a costume. So I just like, oh, I'll be a like surfer asshole. So I just wore a wetsuit <laughs> and played a four-hour job in this thing. And by oh the end, God. it was like... Uh, This is not a good idea. Were you drumming in that or what? Yeah. Oh my God. It was awful. It was awful. I mean, it looked good because, you know, you put it on, you feel like Batman. So it's cool. But I did a a half Iron Man years and years ago. And of course the race starts at like six in the morning because it's like a six and a half, seven hour race or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And I'm standing on the beach and I'm wearing this first time wetsuit kind of thing. And it's like, you know, it just shapes you the way you want to be shaped, you know? And I'm standing on the thing and just this beach full of strangers. They're all going to be racing against each other. And I kind of like, I look at the guy next to me and I said, I feel like Batman. The guy's like, I feel like Batman too. This is like so cool. Yeah, you just totally feel like Batman because it just nips and tucks the perfect way. It's just perfect. That's amazing. Do you think Batman would be able to hack it with an Iron Man situation? No question. You kidding? Not just that. Then he would design some kind of device that would help him, you know, win in some way or or like help the person that's coming in last he would devise some kind of you know bat wheeled assistance device to yeah. to get that kid across the finish line or whatever i feel like he basically is doing an iron man all the time anyway yeah right yeah just with like bullets yes right and then he would have some satori moment of figuring out what the joker's big plan was you know in the middle of the three mile swim the last Hundred yards, would be like, oh yeah, because he, he sees some piece of seaweed that reminds him of a Latin word that does, you know. Yeah, the Joker is going to release just a barrel of snakes into the ocean. Something like that. Like everybody, <laughs> right? To sink the QE three. Were you a big Batman guy 
or any comic books growing up? I was not a comic books guy, but I loved, I loved the 68, 69 Batman show. Because it used to be on in the afternoon when we were kids. Yeah, and I doubly loved that show because as a child, it's Batman. So you're excited, it's bright colors, it's fights. And then as you get from 11 to 12 to 13 to 15 to 16, and you watch those shows again, or you have kept watching them, all of a sudden you realize how brilliantly funny they are Mm -hmm. and how Adam West in his Batman portrayal is, it's just, he's so stupidly funny and underplayed. And one of the most subtle, I think, comedic performances of all time, Mm -hmm. of all time, that he could deliver these lines without ever really like going for the joke or going for the punchline. But, you know, some days you can't get rid of a bomb. When you get that age where you realize, oh, this is funny, there's an entire new sheen on the program. And so you become this like super Batman fan. Plus the fact that my dad watched it in college. You know, when he was in college, it was on, I think, Tuesday and Wednesday nights they used to show this. It's a huge primetime hit, right? Huge primetime hit. And he and his buddies would sit and they would just laugh at how crazy Batman was, not thinking like, oh yeah, my son and... 10 years, 15 years is going to watch this as a boy and then love it as an adult. And plus the cast. The cast is amazing. Yeah. You know, Gorshin and. Did you know he put out a single as the Riddler? <laughs> There's a Riddler single. Frank Zappa produced a Boy Wonder single. Did he really? He did. He loved the show. With Burt Ward. With Burt Ward. I'm the Boy Wonder or something like that. And it's just Burt Ward singing this song like, yeah, I'm the Boy Wonder. Like, check me out. So that would have been like early Mother's Day. For Zappa, right? Prime Mothers. The show is 66. So this is like 67. So this is just right around the mother's time, yeah. That's amazing. I didn't know that. Again, as a growing adolescent boy, to have three cat women from which to choose in terms of whatever (laughs) thoughts one would have as an adolescent, (laughs) I forget about it. Have you guys ever watched interviews with Eartha Kitt? No. Crazy. In like crazy and wonderful and yeah. She is fucking cool as hell, dude. Yeah, it's her own universe, man. Yeah, because she had like a really, really, really rough upbringing and is very honest about it and is very honest about like the disparity between like a sexualized version of herself and the real her, which like she wore like burlap sacks growing up and she says that she still feels like that child. It's very powerful. She's amazing. Her in... uh Emperor's New Groove, the Disney oh, animated yeah. thing. Yeah. I got Disney Plus a couple weeks ago, and I just was kind of working through old stuff. And I remember seeing that in the theater and loving it. And I'd kind of forgotten how Warner Brothersy that one was, how Bugs Bunny-ish that one really was. Yeah. A lot zanier. Very zany. Very zany, very non-sequitur-y. And Eartha Kitt. John Goodman's in that, right? John Goodman plays Pacho, I think was the character's name. He plays sort of that father character. And then yeah. David Spade is perfect. Patrick Warburton. Patrick Warburton. Oh, right. Again, underplays the, yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> it's just so funny. It's so funny. And then there apparently is an entire documentary that has been suppressed by Disney. Originally, it was going to be a full musical. Sting wrote an entire musical's worth of songs. For Emperor's New Groove. For Emperor's New Grooves. It was called something different. And it was this whole kind of Incan musical. And then they just completely changed direction. I don't know if it was the producers or who knows what. It just wasn't working. And so they basically shelved all of Sting's stuff, completely pissing off Sting because he had done like a year's worth of work. They used one song for the end credits that was it. But it's called like Tales from the Hot Box or something like that? Oh, really? Yeah. Sweatbox, Tales from the Sweatbox or something like that? Yeah, it's something like that. And if I recall correctly, it's one of those things where it's like a very Barbara Streisand effect sort of thing where, yes. it, you know, Disney sort of suppressed it, not because it's anything like super salacious. And then it kind of turned into like, oh, here's this thing that's been banned by Disney. Like, Right. They also did in the early 2000s, Emperor's New School, which was like a spinoff TV show. <laughs> oh, I never saw that. With it. Okay. It was fine, probably. I'm never a fan of the kind of the TV version of the thing. It's always really hard. Yeah. Daytime Disney Channel in the early 2000s was like, here's the Lion King show, which was pretty great. Here's Lilo and Stitch, the show, which I also really enjoyed. Right. That's the thing is those films are sort of, they have a broad target in terms of their appealing to multi-generations. I think as the TV shows happen, that kind of large, broad spectrum appeal gets focused to like, oh, we're going to have six to nine-year-olds or whatever that audience is. Yeah. And so you don't get that cross-generational appeal as much. 
not anymore, but I was pitching a kids TV show for a little bit. And we were told when we were talking to Disney, we were like, well, we think this is like for whatever, you know, six to eight year olds. And they were like, oh, this feels more like a Disney junior thing. Uh, so actually you want this for three to four year olds and those are totally different people. So it's so segmented yeah. that- Oh, Disney like, Junior. Disney Junior, which is like the little kids stuff, which is the Lion Guard, which is the spinoff of the Lion King. Love it. It's Simba and Nala, is that right? Nala. Their son, Kion. <laughs> Oh my Which God. is just the fucking stupid. Also voiced by James Earl Jones. Such a strange choice to have a little baby just be, you know, yes. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm pretty sure that show made a bunch of people furries. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. Audrey loved it and listened to it for a while. But yeah, it's so segmented that they were like, you can't tell us about the little kids stuff. You have to go to these guys. So they really regimented. Market share, baby. It's all market share. You got to understand what you're shooting for and what the commercials are going to be hitting. It's fucking crazy. I was just talking to my sister, who has a 12-year-old daughter, and just found out that there was a Beetlejuice Broadway musical, yeah. which was a huge success. I didn't know anything about this. Some of the tunes were actually really cool. I saw some clips from it. A guy that was playing Beetlejuice, I don't know how he did this, because he sang with that kind of gravelly, oh, uh, this kind of thing. Yeah. And he's singing like this. His voice is like perfect. I'm like, how are you doing that? Seven shows a week, eight shows a week. <laughs> how is that possible? Danny, you know, my partner in the band, who was telling me that his vocal coach told him, he was asking about how do people sing like that? And his coach just said, God just loves some people more than others. <laughs> <laughs> like, what can I say? You know, some people can just do it. Either you're God's favorite or you have to sit backstage with an entire carton of cigarettes every day. Yeah. Did you ever do vocal training, George? No, I mean, in college, you know, we had our vocal techniques class and stuff like that. None of which I've used over the years, really. The best training for me was being in a loud band and having to sing backup parts in a cover band. So like, I have to be either, you know, one of the Supremes or I have to be, you know, Tom Jones Harmony, or I have to be a screaming guy in the back of James Brown's band, or I have to be James Brown. Yeah. And so you sort of figure out where it all sits as best as you can, and hopefully it kind of works out. But yeah. doing harmonies and backups and understanding the presence of your voice, how you can modify it in terms of its breathiness, like this is a backup vocal, this is a lead, this is a heart. That's really cool. And you just, you know, it takes two decades to kind of do it. You sort of get slowly get better at it. But no, of course. Yeah. That's been the most educational. Like, yeah, okay, we're going to do Motown tunes and you're going to have to sound like three people at once because we only have two backup singers and they had seven. So go. I was reading, I don't know if this was a Barry Gordy thing or who exactly it was, but apparently they would get in the studio. They would get these guys, write these songs at the top of their range, mm. and they would get in the studio and ask everyone to play up a half step to like <laughs> really like get that like, oh God, you know, kind of yeah. tension in there. But you listen to some of that stuff and I still get shocked when I listen to Little Richard. Oh my God, how does he do it? Lucille, like, you know, yeah. when that first song came out and you listen to what else was popular at the time, and you're like, no wonder white people were scared of this. Like, no wonder this was so frightening. Because, you know, he's screaming. Yeah. Lucy! And you're like, how are you doing that? And at, at, what, 80, he was still doing it too. And pretty much yeah. until the week he died, he could still do that. And yeah, it's that weird effective thing of that upper, that rock and roll upper register, man. Ugh. The one that gets me every time is Fantasy by Earth, Wind & Fire. Is that Maurice White? I don't know who's doing that upper, upper part. I know he had a great falsetto. It feels like a soprano mm -hmm. singing it. And it is so high. Like, I couldn't get within an octave <laughs> of that if I tried. Yeah. And then it's in tune perfectly. <laughs> That's the other thing, too. Like, yes. it's one thing to scream. But then when you're screaming and you're in tune and you're like, what the, what? Really? Yeah. That high vocal line in fantasy is one of my favorite things in all of music. It feels like lightning in a bottle. Yeah. And then you hear bands that like transpose that stuff too, you know, in the pseudo wedding circuit that I'm in, like you hear some bands that transpose and you're just like, you can't. It's like doing Nason Dorma, a, you know, a fourth lower. <laughs> it's like, you can't, what are you doing? Like, just don't do that song. There's some stuff you can lower, but there's this other stuff. It's gotta be a screamer. So, George, you play wedding cover stuff? Yeah, I mean, my day job is playing in a bit. It's called the Philadelphia Funk Authority. It's like a eight or nine piece, you know, horn band. 20, 23 years I've been playing with these guys. Yeah. Damn. Did you have any fun stories that you can tell about playing for weddings? No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Literally not. <laughs> Every gig's exactly the same. Not a single one. Yeah, it's very boring. Everyone does their job perfectly. Everyone's always nice. The 
mothers of brides are perfect. Brides are perfect. <laughs> Venues always have plenty of parking and room for carrying equipment. There's always plenty of stage space. Volume's never an issue. Yeah, perfect acoustics. Perfect acoustics. You're always paid for your overtime. People respect you and they don't think that you're just one step above waiter. Yeah. I'm lucky in that the band that I'm in, I mean, a testament is the fact that we've been around for almost a quarter of a century, is we are very unstandard as a wedding band. Like there's a thing we do, which is sort of this R&B soul funk from the 70s. We do other stuff as well, but that's kind of our main thing. So it's Earth, Wind & Fire, it's Stevie Wonder, it's James Brown, it's that kind of stuff. And we sort of say like, if that's what you want, like we can do that. We don't do, you know, the chicken dance or the electric slide or yeah. fucking Margaritaville. We don't do that stuff. <laughs> like, we're upfront about it. Imagining Margaritaville at a wedding is extremely funny. Oh, I and mean, it happens all, you know, whether it's Brown Eyed Girl or whether it's whatever panoply of horrible songs that have just rubbed themselves into the bane of my lower spinal column. <laughs> you know, the thing that always bugs me is bands that kind of modify the cover tunes that they're doing. You know, mm-hmm. like you're playing a Motown song or you're playing a Stevie Wonder song and then the singers like will change the melody to make it theirs. And it's like, do you really think you're going to come up with a better melody than Stevie Wonder? <laughs> like, like, really? Like, you're going to do a more interesting melody than Smokey Robinson? Like, your version of Tears of a Clown is going to be more interesting than the one that sold six million copies? Like, really? <laughs> You know, like no one would do that with a Mozart, you know, concerto or some kind of a whatever. It's like, no, like this is the piece. And it's also what people want to hear. Well, exactly. If you start doing some weird vocal thing, they're going to be like, what? No, that just sounds wrong. These melismatic spasms that just take over and you just think like, I appreciate that you have a vocal technique. It's wonderful. But like there's a hubris If it's an artist who's doing an interpretation of a tune, fine. If you're Tom Jones, even if you're not an established. Yeah, yeah. But even if, like, that's the gig. Like, the gig is to come see singer A. That's the gig. I'm going to go to this club and I'm going to watch this singer interpret these songs. Great. But at a wedding, at a festival, at a concert, no one is coming to see you. They're coming to hear the music that your band plays. And also these days, I would imagine as people move more towards, hey, I just turned on Spotify with my playlist. Like, it's also rare for people to even hire a band in the first place to do a wedding. Again, you've got to understand that it's not about you, (laughs) you know, and instrumentalists do this too. I mean, I'm so fortunate that everyone in the band learns their parts and plays their parts. And yes, there's some modification sometimes, but to me, the challenge of it is, you know, I've played Superstition by Stevie Wonder probably 500 to 1,000 times I've played that song. And every time you get a little bit closer to how it should be, yeah. like you get a little bit closer, you know, and I used to never comprehend how people could play Broadway shows, you know, eight nights a week. And over time, I kind of learned like, oh, no, that's what it is. You're constantly trying to do it as well as you possibly can, as perfectly as you can. And that's the challenge of it. Like as the drummer, especially, I'm going to make this groove feel the best it's ever felt for the next six minutes. I'll succeed for about 18 seconds, maybe. But I'm going to try to go for six minutes, you know? No matter how many times you play a Stevie song or Superstition in a wedding band, you're not going to be able to have, you know, six Moogs and clavichords and whatever going on at the same (laughs) time anyway. So there's all this studio stuff that's happening that you're never going to touch live. It's an extra challenge to, like, really kind of dial it in with the ensemble. Right, and distill it to what's the essence of the tune that we're trying to convey here. Yeah. And it's like, you know, groove, melody, timbre. Yeah. We don't have 85 tracks to do it with. We have these six guys, seven guys, whatever it is. And that's part of the fun. of. And then when people look and it's like, wait, they have no backup singer. Where are those backup vocals? Oh, because the guitarist and the drummer are singing backup vocals. And oh, the drummer's singing lead now. Oh, okay. And wait a minute. He just sang James Brown and now he's singing, you know, Paul Simon. Like, that's the same guy. Like, how is that? Do you guys ever use tracks? No. We couldn't do our live show without him. Not in the way we are currently doing it. Right. But also, you know, the thing we do, it's more of a comedy thing anyway. And they're your tunes. Yeah. I mean, we do a couple covers, but generally there are tunes. And I have to say, it still feels like cheating to me (laughs) to use them, you know, because I was trained in like jazz and classical stuff. Any ensemble I ever played with, you know, being able to push a button on something and have the perfect version going on, it still feels like I'm doing something morally abhorrent. (laughs) It's a fine line, man. I have a buddy who's in a four-piece rock band and it's all tracks yep 
they'll play fantasy. They'll play September. They'll play all these tunes that have keyboards and horns out the ass. And you're hearing all this stuff. There's three instrumentalists on stage and one singer. And you're hearing this wall. And you're like, I'd just rather hear to the original. If we're going to be listening to 65% tracks, just play the tune. Just spin the tune. I remember Bill Bruford is one of my absolute favorite, not just drummers, but musicians. He used to play for Yes and King Crimson. And, you know, he wrote about seeing Peter Gabriel live. Peter Gabriel, who was brilliant, who was one of my first concerts I ever went to. But Peter uses a lot of tracks. He uses a lot of sequences. So a lot of the percussion you're hearing are these tracks. And that's such a huge part of his deal too, right? Yeah, but Bruford talked about how like his heart was broken because like you want to see the cowbell player. You want to see the shaker guy. And that was one thing I loved when I found out that Ricky Martin, of all people, Ricky Martin, living La Vida Loca guy. Yeah, yeah. Everything that you hear on stage is performed by a person. He insists. Some musician was slagging on Ricky Martin in the middle of the whole La Vida Loca craze and all that stuff. And I was just like, you know, he used to be in this band called Menudo, which was this kind of prefabricated South American band. Leighton, have you ever heard of Menudo? I'm curious. No. Okay. You've heard of NSYNC, right? Yeah. It's a boy band. Manufactured, like, you know, kids auditioned and they these five guys. Yeah. Menudo is literally soup, like a stew. So it's like literally just grabbing people and making this stew. He used to be Menudo and he used to talk to the musicians that were the backing band. And they would always say like, this is a really tough business and whatever, whatever. So when Ricky Martin became a solo artist and became huge, he was like, if there's a shaker part, I'm paying someone to stand on stage and play the shaker. Shake it up. So you watch them on the Emmys and there's 15 guys on stage because everything's being covered. I thought that's really cool. It's a fine line. Yeah. I have a question for both of you. What is, in terms of concerts, the best slash most faithful you've seen live and then also like worst? Undoubtedly, hands down, the best like rock concert I've ever been to was Weird Al. Mm. Hands down. He knows exactly what people want. He gives it to him. You know, I think he's 60 now, and he's just as funny as he was 40 years ago. You know, there's something that happens to people when they get old and they're still in comedy, and it just feels <laughs> terrible. And like, you're just doing the same thing you were, but not in a good way. I've seen him probably five or six times, and every time it's funny. He has the perfect blend to me of multimedia stuff. The last time we saw him was at the Greek with a full orchestra. Oh, fuck yeah. Oh, right. The strings tour or whatever yeah, that thing yeah, was. Yeah, yeah, Strings attached tour. Cute. And it was so, so great playing with a full orchestra. It's not like the original arrangements, but he used the ensemble in what I thought was a really fun and interesting way. I went to see him at the bottom line. Do you remember that club, George, in New York? Oh, yeah. Played there a couple of times, yeah. Yeah. And I went to see him in college. So this would have been 94 or something. And this is kind of at a dip in his popularity. Right. So, you know, he was a big hit in the early and mid 80s in all the, you know, eat it. Michael Jackson stuff, yeah. Like a surgeon kind of days. And then up through, I'd say kind of came back and then just has been on a rocket ship ever since in the late 90s. But in like 94, it, he wasn't super popular. Right. And so we went to see him, the kind of thing where you get there like way too early for something. Mm -hmm. I do this all the time where I'm like, oh, everyone's going to want to go see this. <laughs> right. And then I find it's just some weird thing that I love. I did this a year ago, Terry Riley. Oh, yeah. Yeah, who was doing a concert here of his works and playing himself, uh, was giving a pre-concert talk at UCLA. Okay. And it's like in a small room. And I was like, this is going to be so packed. Everyone's going to show up. Mm -hmm. Leighton might not know. Terry Riley is a very influential, what people would usually call minimalist composer, very avant garde in the 60s. You know, he had some famous pieces, very kind of out there, arty minimalism stuff. We used to do clapping music in college, which was this sort of piece of music. And there's just multiple parts, and you just repeat one bar with a clapping pattern. Yep. That's fun. It's really fun, yeah. Just music nerds being music nerds. But you want to do clapping music? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. NC is his other big 
piece. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah, ding, ding, ding. Oh, I love like it. six minutes of ding, 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 ding. I, ding. On, on long car rides, I would see how many times I could listen to the whole thing because it's like 45, 50 minutes mm -hmm. start to finish. So anyway, I show up to this thing like an hour ahead of time, this little room, and nobody is there. Like six people showed up to hear T Terry Riley. Mm -hmm. Did you know he's an incredible pianist? He's like a, like a honky-tonk pianist. Oh, really? Okay, yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. Complete shredder. He's got the, you know, like the big crazy beard and he's dressed like an old hippie yeah and they're talking to him about the pieces that are going on tonight and they're like hey so do you mind just playing something and he just sits down and does this crazy boogie woogie thing <laughs> of course and i'm just like what the fuck dude like i know i know the bottom line way too early for weird al nobody is there probably 30 people went to see this show it's kind of a small club right and the stage is up the seats basically went perpendicular right to the stage right i was next to the stage just looking up at you know, my idol for comedy and music and everything like I'm doing now, just been a huge fan forever. And it felt sort of like one of those private show. He was a full band, mm -hmm. full rock show. Same guys all those years. John Bermuda Schwartz on drums and Jim West on guitar and Steve J on bass. And then Ruben Valtiera on keys, who was like added in slightly later. And by later, I mean like 1986 or something. I had one of my most satisfying moments of my life was sitting in one of those seats right under the stage because the stage yeah it was like above waist height and then they have these long tables and so you're sitting with strangers because they just pack everybody yep. into this club i'm sure it's a forever 21 now but at the time it was a really really great club and i went to see mike keneally oh wow yeah yeah mike keneally was frank zappa's last guitarist basically the, the last guitarist that frank ever bought and he's had a brilliant career for years. He's still playing. Still playing. Oh, yeah. I'm going to see him next year with King Crimson. They're going on tour with King Crimson. Nice. Anyway, so before this show, a friend of mine who purports to be a drummer, he owns drums. <laughs> I started playing drums when I was seven. He had a habit of copying what I did. Again, it's someone I've known since I'm four years old. So it's, is it a friend? Yeah. It's like... <laughs> You know, it's like the it's like the Seinfeld thing. He had a ping pong table. I would have been yeah. friends with Stalin if he had a ping pong table. You know, so he had a ping pong table. You know, we were in the same school and blah, blah, blah. So he, over time, sort of became a drummer. And he's fine, whatever. <laughs> he ends up being in this, like, post-90s hair band, non-ironic hair rock. Well after the heyday of hair well rock. Well after the heyday. This is like, you know, 93, 94, 95, 96. We'll call them the Zips, right? He's in this band called the Zips. And so one day he calls me and he always wanted to talk about gear. I hate talking about gear. Yeah, me too. I don't care about gear. When someone comes up to me and says, what kind of drums are those? I just go, tell me about your drums. <laughs> like, obviously you want to talk to me about your drums. So just get to it. Like I, these are round. That's the, what kind? <laughs> round. Blue. It's the drum kind. Tell me. I'll listen. Tell me what you have, you know. But he's always, oh, I got this new snare drum. And it's like, uh, oh, yeah, it's the fiber vibe, you know, with the six inch. And I'm just like, yeah, okay, cool. And he's like, oh, hey, by the way, the Zips, we're going to be opening up for Dweezil's band. And I'm like, wait, what? Now, Frank Zappa's son, Dweezil, had a band called Z in the 90s. It was Dweezil and Ahmet, the two sons. And it was Mike Keneally and a bass player as well who was played with Frank forever. And, you know, through college, Zappa was my church. I learned more from listening to Zappa records during college than I learned in college. Like, no shit. So my buddy casually says, Yeah, the Zips are going to be opening for... They're called Z or something. I don't know, whatever. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm about to throw the phone through the window because I'm thinking like, you know, first off, I would just kill to meet these guys, let alone open for them, whatever. Yeah. I'm like, well, have a great show. Enjoy your Fiber Lux yeah. six inch snare drum, whatever the fuck you're playing. Great. Enjoy. <laughs> like, hang up. We fast forward five, six years after that conversation. I'm sitting at the club at the bottom line there, right under the stage, waiting for Mike's show to start. And there's, of course, across from me is a stranger. And as happens with any kind of concert, you start just talking and you're obviously fans of the thing. So, oh, have you ever seen Zappy? You ever see this? You ever see that? This guy says, did you ever see Z? Yeah, I saw Z at the Asbury Park years ago. Yeah. And this guy who's sitting across from me, this total stranger, he says, when I saw them there, there was this opening band who were fucking horrible. <laughs> it's like the, the Zeds, the something, the something. 
talk about served cold, you know, like five years <laughs> later. And I just said, dude, you just made my night. Thank you so much. Because he just said they were this horrible metal hairband, like no one liked them. They were just like really bad. And I know it's terrible to just have this schadenfreude, zappenfreude kind of moment, but I just <laughs> didn't give a shit. There's the episode title. Good. <laughs> what about you, Layton? What's your concert? Uh, shit, this was one I asked, not because I had an answer, but because I wanted to pass the buck. Well, I'm just curious what you've seen. So, George, just for context, Leighton is 23. I'm almost 24. You're almost 24, but you're not 24. So has grew up with some different music than we did. Did you go to any, like, big, as a kid kid, like, as a 12 or 13, like a... <laughs> My parents would let me go to concerts. No? Okay, I don't because I know, I know parents, and I'll, like, go, and you go see... Yeah whatever the thing. I don't want to presume your tastes, but you know, Miley or... Oh, fuck no. Strangers were going to give me drugs or attack me, so not allowed. Oh, okay. Because you have these gigantic, you know, whether it's the Jonas Brothers or whatever, you know. My parents dropped me off in front of Giant Stadium in 88 to go see the dead. Like, (laughs) what the fuck were you thinking? I was 13. Like, wow, terrible idea. That was my first concert. The Dead at Giant Stadium in 88. Yeah. Touch of Grey Tour. Mm. You know what? I know absolutely jack shit about the dead. That's good. That's fine. That's the correct amount. Yeah. It's music that I experience through others. Yeah. I like the dead, actually. A lot of people do. I've just never been into it. Anyway, sorry. Layton. My very first concert was Neutral Milk Hotel on their final tour, which fucking ripped. And in terms of bad opening bands, the people they were touring with were this band called The Shags. Do you guys know about the Shags? Like the Shags? Oh, sure. The Shags. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh. I can't believe you saw the Shags live. The actual <laughs> Shags. I didn't realize they still toured. <laughs> Neither did I. Wow. Dude, they opened up with my pal Foot Foot, <laughs> and I didn't know anything about the Shags. Wow. How old were you? 16, probably. That's the way to do it. Completely thrown. During that concert, I went with friends who were way cooler than me, who I was trying to get to know better. And we were seated like on the opposite sides of the theater at the beginning of Neutral Milk Hotel concerts. They're like, please do not film. It makes us uncomfortable. Mm. They're sitting next to this guy who's filming the entire time. And they're like, dude, this is really disrespectful. Like you got to stop. And then the guy pulls up his sleeve and he's like, you want to see real respect? And then pulls back the sleeve and it's a tattoo of Anne Frank with Neutral Milk Hotel <laughs> I love that album. That compilation was great. Boy, the way she sang with them, that was amazing. (laughs) That's something. I'm sorry. I still can't get over the fact that the Shags are A, alive. I know. I know. Could perform. (laughs) In performing conditions. What's their writer look like on the contract? Oh, my God. Can you imagine? Six jars of Play-Doh. Yeah. (laughs) We went outside after the concert. I immediately watched somebody get hit by a car. (laughs) And then (laughs) I've talked about Tommy Lee on the show before, but we went to like an IHOP afterwards and this guy who was very, very interesting just came and sat with us and was talking about how we're all going to be secretaries of weed when he's president. Oh yeah, I remember that story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was like, you know what? I'm a real patriot. He pulls off his shoe. Oh wait, I can't show my feet. God damn it. (laughs) I didn't show foot. Censor that. Okay. I'm not cutting that out. (laughs) He slams his foot on the table and he has like tiny American flags painted on all of his toes. (laughs) It was the most bizarre night of my life. Anyway, in terms of like most uh, faithful, Father John Misty at the Greek, that man is fucking incredible. His singing is like amazing. And he has like beautiful long legs and like heeled boots. And it's just kind of like prancing around the stage. It was the best. Yeah. Again, this is all boomer stuff, but I saw King Crimson in 2002 at the uh, Town Hall, which is a smaller venue. Yeah, yeah. Now, at the time, this is a band that had been around for 40-ish years in 2002. They had their 50th yeah, a little while back. So the average age of the guys in the band was probably 60. Sounds about right. Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe a little bit below. Because Fripp's in his 70s now, right? Fripp is now in his 70s, yeah. But at the time, this is, yeah, again, 2002. Talk about accurate. They basically played all of the album they had just released, And they didn't play anything older than something from like one or two albums previous, which I just thought was so for a pseudo classic band to like, we're not playing anything older than 1998. Especially with that audience full of prog nerds. Yes. But interestingly enough, like that audience has learned over time, like that you don't expect to hear anything older than, especially then. Now, of course, the band now is 
I think the best it's ever been. They have three drummers. It's a whole thing. Now the average age is like 70, but they still destroy. They just destroy it. They are so the antithesis of what one of their contemporaries, like you go see Yes, it's just sad. You go see, you know, like this new Genesis show to where I'm wondering what that's going to be like. I'm sure it's going to be fine, but you see some band, you know, you see Fog Hat or whatever. It's just like, oh, guys, <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing? It's like the original roadie's cousin is the only guy in the band that's remained there, you know, from the thing. Yeah. But uh, Crimson, that, that 2004 show. If you didn't know it was King Crimson, you would just think it was this absolutely avant-garde, you know, yeah. electronica-based band that actually played their instruments and stuff. That was an amazing show. It's amazing. I was just listening to the, I forget the name of the album, but the Wives of Henry VIII album. Oh, with Rick Wakeman? Yeah. That's a keyboardist from Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of that prog stuff just goes like, and that's why he left Yes, right? He left, came back, he left, came back. I mean, the, that band has had, I think, 31 people in it or something like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bananas. Uh, speaking Shh. of gigs, actually. Oh, were you going to say, should we introduce ourselves? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. We should. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the podcast, Late Night with Brian Wecht, which you've probably been listening to for an hour at this point or something like that. That voice you just heard, that's Brian Wecht. Everyone, that's Layton. Hi. Mystery guest. <laughs> whose name we've said several times. Would you care to introduce yourself? I love the 44-minute cold open. That's our aesthetic. That's how we roll. This is George Robb from the Geologic Podcast, but who cares? <laughs> who cares? Great. Perfect introduction. Speaking of gigs, I want to read you guys an email that we got recently. <sighs> this was pretty next level, and I've been thinking about it a lot. I'm going to edit out a lot of details. So this was sent to the Ninja Sex Party email. Wait, what's the subject line? You know what? Thank you for asking. <laughs> The subject line is actually really, really great. Okay, so the subject line is wedding in location, <laughs> redacted, plus XP, meaning experience points, free food and drink, and $2 signs. All right, so now here's the body of the email. Hello, my name is Name, and I would like to negotiate NSP for doing a four-hour performance Time can be negotiated at a wedding on date in location. Ninja Sex Party is the wish list performer for the bride and groom. My offers include, here's what she's leading with, <laughs> material for a new song, new in all caps. I don't want to give too much away, but this wedding is absolutely in sync with NSP's theme and music. This wedding will absolutely water the pump for NSP's creativity and international appeal. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> All members of the band and crew are invited and encouraged to enjoy the party during their breaks and after the performance. There'll be both alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverages, along with a generous vegan and meat menu. Vegan options will be prepared and cooked on separate surfaces from the meat. All right, that's it. That's the offer. Caveats. Price for NSP needs to be discussed. The bride and groom aren't expecting a free performance, but they are in a budget. Price does need to be negotiated and signed before any other agreement is made. Hotel accommodations will not be provided. <laughs> NSP will have the option of camping out in location, but the site is rough, meaning that there are no septic or water stations <laughs> on site for trailers. I can reserve and negotiate a decently priced set of rooms at a hotel 30 miles away from the location. <laughs> if NSP does choose the hotel, I require a signed agreement along with the size of their group 90 days in advance. Thank you for your consideration. <laughs> That's now obviously, George, you have literally infinitely more experience playing weddings than I do. That's fucking nuts, right? What a deal. You have to come up with an offer, which is just insane. You're like, okay, $385,000. I mean, we're not going to write that person back, but you've presented a very appealing offer, and we are super interested to go camp. That's right. No yeah. <laughs> Well, somehow they found something worse than offering it for exposure. They offered it for experience points. Right. And international appeal? Yeah. Any co-writing offer on a gig, like we're going we're gonna to write <laughs> yeah. songs with you, basically. We're going to provide you material and that'll bring the price down. Right. That's, that's a new one. That's yeah. pretty fantastic. There's a whole record there, I think, you know, on some yeah. level. <laughs> you know, so maybe they're not wrong is what you're saying. Speaking of shacks, that <laughs> might be kind of perfect, you know. I know that you can't say where it is, but how far away is the place that they want you to? Are you flying? No, it would be like a long drive from L.A. It's like the woods somewhere in California. Mm. 
This sounds like a great way to get murdered. Yeah, well, the other thing is clearly they're big fans. Right. And, I mean, the last thing you want to do is, like, disappoint people who really like what you do anyway. I, I think the person who was writing us, she's clearly not one of the people getting married. But, oh, my God. It's amazing how the separation, the disparity between what people perceive to be, you know, costs incurred at something, what they actually are, like— there's such a cluelessness sometimes. Like, do you have any concept of what this would cost? Yeah. This thing that you want? Four hour <laughs> set. I mean, look, when we put out an album, they're comedy albums. They're like half an hour. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, a typical concert length thing for us, our set is at most an hour and a half. Yeah. Max. Yeah. Also, half our band lives in Canada. So just for the record. <laughs> like, you know. Yeah. And also, like, I don't understand the appeal of wanting to have like a quote unquote celebrity at your wedding. Like, isn't that going to overshadow? I'm sorry to call you a quote unquote celebrity. Right. No, no, I prefer the phrase <laughs> D-lister. So my question basically, George, was that is as crazy as I think it is, right? Oh yeah, for sure. Okay. For sure. Uh, the problem is since you do have a presence in terms of even as a D-lister or a semi, whatever yeah. Leighton said, I wouldn't want to repeat it, <laughs> but you don't want to necessarily give them some kind of offer that they could then post and be like, look at these assholes. They want, you know? Yeah. So it's a very delicate thing to be like, perhaps you do not realize how uh, cost prohibitive something like this would actually be. If you could let us know what your budget is yeah, and then you put it back on them, they come back and they say, yeah, we have $1,200. Then you could be like, mm, that's not going to be Right. Or they say, because who knows what their scale of relevance is, they say, we only have half a million dollars. You could be like, well. And you just never know what these things. You don't know. You really don't know. Usually it tends to be the low end of like, yeah, we can give the band a hundred bucks and beer. And you'd be like, mm, yeah, no, nah, it's not going to work. Yeah. We've never done like a private gig like that. I don't think it's totally out of the question. It's just logistically fucking hard. Yeah, because then there's all the sound equipment, and then, like, when is there going to be a stage? Is there, like— And this is to play an outdoor show yeah. where they haven't talked about— Is there power? Is there thing? Is Yeah. Yeah. Again, you don't want to necessarily not respond? Oh, no, I do necessarily want to not respond. Okay. Sometimes you don't want to start a conversation. But now, if they are a fan, will they have listened to this episode? I think this person will not have listened to the episode. Hmm. Yeah, no, it is a good question. Because you could say, no, that wasn't you. Totally different uh, wedding A different offer. email that I read verbatim. Yes. <laughs> Pure coincidence. Yeah, amazing. Once in a lifetime. Never going to happen again. Yeah, because you guys get asked to play weddings constantly, right? Or at least go. We do, but George, you well know, like, if that's not what your band does, yeah. that is a heavy lift. Yeah. Because essentially what they're saying is, hey, we want you to learn three hours of songs. Yeah. Famous bands do it. Like you can hire Earth, Wind & Fire to come play your wedding, but they do their set. They have a rider, which is gigantic. Yep. They say, we're going to do 60 minutes. This is what we'll do. You have to have this available to us and blah, blah, blah. And it costs you whatever, a quarter million dollars to do it. You can do it. You can hire pretty much anybody, but they come and they do their show. They're not going to do a four hour That's right. wedding reception <laughs> kind of thing. That's what we would probably do. And I never want to say it's out of the question. Like, yeah. you know, you hear these things about like, oh, the King of Jordan wants you to come play at his, you know, private yacht. Right. Sure. Yeah. I'm, am I going to do that? A hundred percent I'm going to do that. Wow. A yacht wedding would be fucking tight. Rachel has an amazing story about having to do, she did an improv gig once on a floating platform mm. at Boston <laughs> Harbor. And she said the whole time they're acting, this thing is just going back and forth and if people are starting to get seasick and no one can hear them because the seagulls are going crazy <laughs> and you know it's right in Boston Harbor. You can just hear the racism coming off the shore too. <laughs> that feels like a perfect opportunity to incorporate the inevitable motion sickness vomit into your bit. Like yeah. the physical comedy, you can totally make it happen. I've had to carry equipment onto boat gigs. We did a around New York kind of tour thing with fireworks, Hudson River things. And it was, you have this gangplank, which is about, it's way longer than it should be. It's like 30, 30 yards of gangplank. <laughs> yeah. It's about that wide. And it's just going like this. It's just sort of swaying up and down the whole time. And you're looking at this thing going, all right, every piece of equipment that I have <laughs> is in my car and has to get onto that boat. Someone's got to like roll a base cab up that thing. Yeah. I've done a couple of boat gigs also, and it's fun in a way, but yeah, the setup is kind of nuts. I did a prom once on a circle line kind of thing going around in Philadelphia. High school prom on a boat. 
<laughs> just like, okay. But it is convenient just to vomit over the side. So it's kind of nice. You know, you do have this yeah. huge toilet you can just kind of use. Have you ever done one of those like cruise, cruise it, like a skeptics cruise? I did the Galapagos thing. Oh, of course. I was asked to go to the Galapagos. <sighs> That was so cool. That was still early in my kind of skeptic career, whatever you want to call it. And I was shocked when the guy said, we'd love for you to come be one of the D-listers, F-list celebrities on this thing. I was like, okay. I only had to pay for airfare. And I was like, sure. That's amazing. If you ever get the chance to go to the Galapagos, go. That was incredible. Did you get to see any creatures? All the creatures. I mean, from blue-footed boobies to... George the tortoise. George the tortoise who was there when Darwin was there. Yes. You know, this 170-year-old tortoise. And then these iguanas snorkeling with sea lions that just come right up to you. Because there is no evolutionary fear of humans, because we haven't been around there long enough, these animals just don't give a shit. So they just hang out. And, you know, you get out of their way. Like, they don't care. They know you're not going to club them over the head. I mean, they haven't evolved to be afraid of humans yet. Yeah. So the sea lions are just like, oh, people to hang out with. Cool. And then the birds just come up to you and the iguanas just come up to you. And each island is its own sort of disparate ecosystem. So you have the island of the jungle kind of stuff. And then you have the desert island. And then you have the rainforest island. You know, it's all an Ecuadorian national park. Mm -hmm. So it's very regulated. As it fucking should be. As it should be. You know, initially you have this image of you get to run along the beach of the thing and you... Yeah, and ride a tortoise into the water, yeah. Right, yeah. And then you get there and they're like, okay, it's like eight people at a time are allowed. You have to be 50 yards apart from each subset of eight people. You have to stay between these pylons that get put out and changed every week or whatever. And you go, oh, okay, (laughs) I guess. But then once you're in the middle of it and you realize how pristine and beautiful and preserved all this stuff is, you go oh, okay, they're doing it right. This is great. Yeah. You're on the main boat and you take a little dinghy to the island. We were heading back to the main boat after a day of spending on whatever the third or fourth island we were on. And all of a sudden the boat guy gets this kind of look in his eye like something's going on. We're like, okay, and he turns the boat around. Hard 180 turn, like what's going on? And he heads straight into these like rocky shore. And he stops and he kind of bends over the side of the boat and he pulls out this plastic bag. And he had seen this white plastic bag floating and he's like this is my island no one pollutes my island oh shit he took this like eight minute detour because he knew that's not natural that's something i gotta get he's got a great we're like okay respeto molto yeah it was really cool i mean that's stewardship that's like how you do completely it. it was like this personal pride of all these guides of even so much that when the boats take on water for cleaning purposes or whatever they have to dump it in the same place they got it to make sure the microbes are the same Yeah. So like when you take up a couple gallons of whatever you're doing into the ship to use for whatever, you got to come back to that initial area where you were to redump all the water out so that all the microbes, you're not cross-contaminating. I mean, it's just so well done. That's so cool. Who else was on the cruise with you? James Randi was on the cruise. Layton, do you know who that is? No. He was a magician who basically realized that some people were using the tricks that he had learned or he had learned over time to steal money from people by convincing them that they could talk to dead people, that they could tell the future, that whatever. And so he became kind of this Uh. patron saint of debunking people. Houdini did it. That's right. He inspired him. But he was the first to kind of really popularize it. But he was also a really cool guy. There was a musician called Alice Cooper, who I don't know if you know him, rock guy. And so Alice Cooper wanted to have his head cut off as the big finale of his show in the 70s. Respect. So he apparently went into a phone book and wanted to find a magician. And he found Randy. And Randy said, yeah, I can totally design a thing that's going to make it look like we cut your head off. They so hit it off that he became one of the touring members He played a part of a demented dentist. Yeah, that's right. So like at one point during the show, during this huge 70s rock production, cocaine-based rock production, he goes to the dentist. And so Randy, who's a short guy, he's this tiny little guy. He's like, you know, whatever, 5'5", 1". But he would have this massive drill and he would drill like Alice's face with this drill. You know, he was the hangman. He was the executioner who would cut his head off. And at this point, Alice is playing like arena shows and stuff, right? Huge, huge, huge shows. Right. Yeah. Yeah, this is all billion dollar babies and all that kind of stuff. But then Randy develops this thing called the James Randy Educational Foundation. He sets up this million dollar challenge. He says, if you have any kind of extra sensory 
powers, anything, I'll give you a million bucks. He's most famous for this, probably. I think so, yeah. Johnny Carson gave him like $100,000. Some celebrities gave him stuff. He raised all this money, and in the bank was a million bucks. He had the stubs to prove. And he said, as long as I can test you and you'll agree to the protocol. That's right. You can't say, oh, I, I didn't agree to that. You have to say what your powers are and how you want to be tested. I'll set up the test and we'll do it. And in 25 years, no one got past the preliminary test. Because as soon as you did it in some kind of a laboratory setting controlled thing, like no one could do the thing. And it went from, you know, people that could tell the suits of cards, people that could tell the sex of pregnant women. I mean, like everything you possibly imagine. Yeah. I can't even imagine the messages those guys got. Oh, talk about wedding, you know, requests. Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> that must have been a full-time job for a while is fielding those. I would imagine on the face of it, if you're really doing that right, you kind of have to take all of them seriously to begin with. Right. Yeah. Because you don't want to risk them saying, oh, well, you've spoiled it. That's right. They used to do these conferences in Vegas, and at the end of the week, you would have a live million-dollar challenge. I was the MC for these events, but for this particular thing, I was in the audience for this, and there was like 800 people in the audience, and we're watching this woman who claimed using a pendulum thing, she could figure out the suits of playing cards that were inside envelopes. What? Fine. <laughs> so... Imagine an auditorium full of 800 people, right? 800 plus people. None of whom are on your side, by the way, from the start <laughs> for this woman. That's the thing is, yeah, we're all of the like-minded realizing this is all BS. But nobody wants to affect the test in any way that will allow the person who's taking the test to say, oh, you made a noise. Okay, forget it. I'm done. I'm leaving. That's why it didn't work. Right. So it was like 45 minutes of 800 people sitting in absolute still quiet like just like everybody was like this for 45 minutes i mean chairs weren't creaking no sniffles it was the creepiest thing to be in a room <laughs> of almost a thousand people and no noise apart from what's happening on stage is happening as soon as they finished the test like a banachek who's this magician who was running the whole thing he was like that completes the test you heard this like <laughs> and 800 people all exhaled and then just like, and then every chair moved and every cough and every hiccup and every sneeze happened. Like that should have been the magic actually that you could get 800 people because no one wanted to be the one who was going to fuck up the test, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It was astounding. It was so cool. And this kind of camaraderie of like, I'm not going to be the one to sneeze. It ain't going to be me. Did they release the results then and there? Oh, like right away, they showed that she just didn't get it. Another year, they had one of those guys with the bracelets that supposedly give you like super muscle strength and whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was the one that was supposed to be able to tell if the bracelet the person had on was real or not. All right. Total failure, total failure, you know. And of course, afterwards, they always say, oh, the AC was on or, oh, you know, yeah. the moon was doing its thing, or there was a 747 that flew over at the wrong, that's why it didn't work. You know? Bad vibes, yeah, whatever, yeah. You've got to admire, though, the balls of someone to get up in that room in particular and do that, like... There's a delusion, I think. Yeah, it must be, right? Most of those people think that they have the power. Yeah. There's very few, I think, they exist, but there are very few that consciously are like, I am fooling people. Most of the people that apply for that prize most of the people that do those things they legitimately think that they have what they claim they have yeah and it's not that it's a combination of just perception it's a combination of whatever luck and blah 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 once it's explained to them hey this is what's happening you know this is why you are perceiving your powers to be real like they're not real it's because you are unconsciously moving that person's shoulder this direction and very rarely do they go Oh, oh, okay. Oh, yeah. that makes sense. I see. Sometimes it happens and it's great. Then you have like a person that's then going to be on your team forever. But most of the time it's, yeah, but the lights, yeah, these lights were kind of. It's the same thing as the famous, the deficit model doesn't work kind of stuff with science communication. Do you know what I'm talking about? I'm not sure, no. So the deficit model is this idea that, oh, if you just tell people the facts, they'll change their minds. Oh, yeah. And this is like literally 
if anything has been proven to not work, I mean, yeah, okay, sometimes that will work. Sometimes people will have a aha moment and then totally change their point of view. Yeah, but that's a personality thing. But mostly it's digging your heels in even harder because part of it's like sunk cost fallacy. This I identify with this. So if I lose this, I lose my identity. Yep. And blah, blah. Yeah. We need to do segments. Yes. So let's go into segments. Our first segment is the pop culture recommendation segment where you get to recommend any kind of pop culture thing you like, book, movie, video game, etc. It's called What's Poppin', and here's the theme song, which we add in post. Well, I'm, talk <laughs> about training. Like that, wow. Yeah, more. Wow. Did you ever have those mouth sounds books in the 80s? No. But I watched the guy in Nickelodeon that did the mouth sounds. I forget his name, Andrew something. But like a blonde British yes. guy? Yes, 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 yes. He had that kind of very sweepy kind of blonde yes, hair. Yes, exactly. He had books, I guess based on those, which I didn't know was a show. And this is one of the craziest things you can imagine. Tried to teach you in print. In print. Obviously, you know, there's no like, unless you're going to buy a VHS or something. Well, now I want that VHS. The Mouth Sounds VHS. Oh, I was obsessed with these. He had two, I think one was called Mouth Sounds and the other was like Zoinks or something like that. Mm. And he would be like, okay, take the tip of your index finger and place it, you know, slightly <laughs> under your upper lip, one centimeter. But one of them was the the drip of the, and it would be very specific. Yeah. He would have these very specific, it's like elephant running. Like, okay. So if you want him to sound like an elephant, I'm like, what are you talking about? Who does yeah. this? That was an impressive drip. What's popping? What's popping? Anyway. Pop culture, Layton, what's popping? What's popping for me is God, if you're not up there, I'm fucked by Daryl Hammond of SNL fame. Oh, yeah. Do you guys know about his like background? Yes, his cutting and all that stuff and like yes. his abuse and sad story, man. All I knew is, is that he had a very troubled life and that's about the extent of it. Yes, I did not know about that until Susie told me over the weekend because I think she watched the documentary Cracked Up, which is about that. And so I've been reading the book and it's like way better written than I expected. He wrote it himself. It's an autobiography. Yes. And it's really like sad and moving. And I don't know, as a fellow bipolar who had a rough childhood, I'm like, hey, <laughs> look at that. That's, it's, you're very sad. I'm sorry, buddy. <laughs> but yeah, I recommend it. It's good. I'm not done with it, but it's fun. Is it recent or was it from a while back? It might be from a while back. I'm not sure. A years back. Yeah. No, he would tell stories of like being on the set of SNL and just being suicidal and being anxious and miserable. and Yeah, and like cutting backstage. To settle himself down, to be able to go on stage, to do you know, a brilliant Bill Clinton impression. and Yeah, because he only got positive attention from his mom if he was being funny. What a tragedy. A major alcohol problem too, I think. Yeah, he started drinking at 14. Oh my God. God. That's wild. But yeah, I enjoy hearing people who are very good at things talk about life being hard because uh, yeah. hashtag relatable. Mm -hmm. SNL is fascinating too. There's just something about it. It's such an institution. Hearing behind the scenes stories of people who were slash are a part of it. I'll never get tired of that stuff. That book from a couple of years back was outstanding. The whole like 40 years of SNL backstage thing. Oh yeah. They interviewed everyone. Is that the live from New York? Was that the name of it? I think that's what it was called. Yeah. 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 Where there's like a collage on the cover. Yeah. I also love like the stories from Bill Hader about having panic attacks mid sketches. <laughs> uh, Cause he like really hated it and has terrible anxiety and like is on Lexapro and shit. God bless. You know, his approach, the thing he would do before a sketch, he would blow his first line on purpose. <laughs> In the sketch? In the sketch. He would make a mistake. He's like, okay, I've made the mistake. Now I can just relax. That's smart. And you see it, you know, whether he's playing a game show host or whatever, he's got that great voice, whatever he's doing. Yeah, yeah. And he'll just sort of stutter and he'll very early in the sketch, he'll blow a line just a little bit. I had no idea that was on purpose. And then he could relax and he could relax. And it's like, okay, I've made the mistake. Now I can just move on. I fucking love Barry very much, but it's like, oh my gosh. Yes. Okay. Nobody watches this show that I know. So it's always me foisting that first episode on like, please, please, please. It's the best. <laughs> also, this resurgence that Henry Winkler is having yes. in the last, I don't know, <sighs> five, 10 years. Whoa. That guy, A, he just reminds me of all my older Jewish relatives. Like, <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, that, that's Gil Wasserman. Yeah. Of course, you'd come over all the time. That he's like, kind of America's grandpa now. And he's so funny in that show. Perfect casting. Yeah. Yeah. Steven Root, 
Anthony Kerrigan, Sarah Goldberg. Uh, Sarah Goldberg's amazing in that show. That young, vicious girl who beats the crap out of him. Oh. I don't know the actress's name, but that's like a 14-year-old or 13-year-old stunt woman's daughter, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a real-life father-daughter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great show. What I was actually going to say about it is the idea of somebody being really, really good at something that they hate doing is like how Bill felt about doing SNL. Mm. <laughs> I was just listening to Ellen Burstyn on Mark Marin. It has nothing to do with SNL, like classic theater. And She was the mom in The Exorcist. Oh. Yeah, classic old school actress. She's like 90 now. And she was talking about doing something with Gene Hackman. And she was like, yeah, I don't know anyone that hates acting more than Gene Hackman. <laughs> he just fucking hates it. He doesn't want to do it, but he's amazing at it. And he just hates it. Doesn't want to be involved. You know, he hasn't been in anything in, I don't know, 20 years or something now. Long time. And it's off in a cabin in the woods somewhere because he hates the thing he's amazing at. He filmed Mooseport live from Mooseport or something where he played the president, a retired oh, yeah. president running for mayor. And he so hated that, that that was his last movie. He's like, I'm done. Yeah. No more. Do you guys have something that you're like really good at that you hate? I don't know if I have something I'm really good at. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> or that, that you're called on to do sometimes because you supposedly excel at it. Yes. But my answer is boring which is organizing. It's not boring. I'm very good at keeping a lot of threads in play and I'm very detail oriented. And what that becomes in a lot of various collaborations is I just kind of take the ball and then keep rolling it and other people tune out. Uh, <laughs> and it becomes, I'm just like, I don't want to be the person that's copy editing this, but everyone I'm working with doesn't see spelling or grammar. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, yeah. It's a constant, constant struggle for me to be like, okay, I'm just going to let it go. I'm not going to worry about this. Oh, no, wait. That whole paragraph is spelled wrong. I got to <laughs> step in and fix it. Double space. Why is there a double space there? What the fuck? Yeah. 100%. Mine is probably visual art, which I went to school for. I like mostly stopped doing it professionally for a reason. I guess rationally based on what other people tell me, I'm good. I don't personally believe that. And I just like have to do it for myself as like relaxation, but doing it professionally like takes so fucking much out of me. Yeah. What about you, George? For me, it's like running the band, like the just the on the gig. When's the break over? When do we have to be back on stage? I write the set lists and all that kind of stuff. That was the first MC work that I did was from the band because mm -hmm. just nobody else wanted to do it. And I'm good at it, but to just go to a gig and play drums, oh, that'd be so great. That would be so, like occasionally I get pickup jobs where I have to go play a quartet or something. And it's like, I come, I set my drums up, I play and I go home. And it's like, oh man, dude, this is so great. That's exactly what I'm talking about was I just want to not be in charge of stuff. Yeah, but if someone else starts doing it, I was like, guys, we can't do three ballads in a row. What are you thinking? 100%. I can't go to weddings because I sit at the wedding like, what's she doing? She, okay, <laughs> you're, you're fucking the cake is right over there. The cake, she's signaling you for the cake. She's uh. <laughs> <laughs> My thing with that that I've been thinking a lot about recently is how some people just don't double check things. Ugh. And I'm like, what? You didn't double check the time that this start? You know, it's like, no, that's double, double check. Yeah. Anyway, George, what's popping? Oh my gosh, I don't read much fiction. I read mostly nonfiction just because that's my brain is wired. And fiction's got to grab me by the lapels and just pull me through the phone booth. But I read Project Hail Mary. Oh, yeah. Andy Weir's newest one. He's the guy that wrote The Martian. And he had a second book called Artemis that was good. Martian was fantastic. Artemis was good. Project Hail Mary. And it's one of these stories that I can't say anything about it because the experience of reading it from the first page, I mean, all you can say is a guy wakes up, he doesn't know where he is, he doesn't know who he is, and he has to figure out where he is and why he is. <laughs> you know, like some stories have a thing that happens in the plot that drives it and you go, really? Like, why would you make that choice? Why would you do it? Not once in this entire book do you go, boy, that was a stupid thing to do. Or if a stupid thing happens, the character's like, oh my God, that was such a stupid thing that I did. Why did I do that? Blah, 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 blah. I tore through this book. As science fiction goes, it's fantastic. And the end takes this turn. I thought it was going to end one way, which I would have been totally happy with, but it ended another way. And I'm sitting there with the freaking tears coming. Like, yeah, how often does that happen? You read a book and I'm crying. It was just like, what? What? Yeah. Project Hail Mary, cannot recommend it highly enough. Hell yeah. I've still never read The Martian. That's very similar too. It's not a sequel or anything, but it's a spiritual sequel on some level. But yeah, read The Martian for sure. Brian, what's popping? 
what's popping for me is it's pretty rare for me these days to hear a piece of music where I'm just like, what? Oh my God. And I've known about this composer, Brian Fernihu. Do you know this name, George? No. He's British composer who's probably in his seventies or so now. And I don't even know why I was thinking about him the other day. Cause I was like, what's a composer I don't know much about. Oh, I've heard of this guy. He used to teach at UCSD when I was a grad student there in physics. And I remember it was actually an offhand comment that a music grad student made. I was doing some stuff in the music department and, and this woman, there was some piece and she goes, oh yeah, that's classic. Like, Fernie who <laughs> this comment was made 20 years ago, never investigated this comment since then. But for whatever reason, last week, I'm like, oh, I wonder what that means. And so I looked this guy up. He is apparently a part of something often called the new complexity in classical music, where if you Google these scores, they are the craziest fucking things you've ever seen. They've got everything. Like I have a music brain, George, you have a music brain. I don't understand how a brain can read these things and perform them accurately. Wild time signatures, microtones, dynamics all over the place. He's not a serial composer. He's just kind of doing this thing. So he has this piece, I believe his first orchestral piece called, and I'm going to butcher this pronunciation. It's the French for the earth is a man, which is something like la terre est un homme. Okay. Close enough. And the first time I had this with a piece of music was a Schoenberg piece when I was in high school, <laughs> where I was just like, music can sound like that. This is how I felt listening to this Fernie Ho piece. It was premiered in Glasgow, I don't know, whenever this was, a while ago in the 80s probably. And they fucked it up so bad, the guy didn't write another orchestral piece for like 30 years or something. Because it's impossible. Every line is this virtuosic, crazy time signature, polytonal, microtonal, like all this stuff is going on. I've listened to it, I think, about 10 times in the past three days. It's not that long. It's like 12, 13 minutes. I still can't quite grok the structure <laughs> of it. Now, what are you listening to? That first performance that was bad? Or is there another version of it? Very recently, the BBC Orchestra, I forget the exact name. This guy has been a, a, a well-regarded composer throughout. But finally, someone's like, look, we got to get this right, guys. Like, let's go back and actually do it. And he wrote a newer orchestral piece and a bunch of stuff too. So there's a fairly recent album where they recorded it. And the performance is just unbelievable. And you listen to it and it's just complete chaos with like hints of structure happening throughout. Occasionally the thing congeals and then it breaks apart. It's the kind of thing that probably if you just gave it a very superficial listening would give classical music a bad name. But when I've been listening to it, to me, it is one of the more emotionally resonant mm. pieces I've heard in a really long time. It like sounds like someone having a breakdown Ooh. and then kind of getting it back together. Would you spell this artist's name if anybody wants to look it up? Yeah. So his first name is, is unusual. It's Brian, Ooh. which is B-R-I-A-N. And his last name is Fernieho, which is, I'm probably also not quite pronouncing correctly, but it is F-E-R-N-E-Y. H-O-U-G-H. Jesus. And he is a contemporary composer who has a lot of wild stuff. And I've just been obsessed with this dude. So I've been so obsessed with it that I just bought the score. Wow. I was going to say, were you, were you following the score as you're listening? Okay. Google La Terre et un homme. La Terre, T-E-R-R-E, E-S-T, un homme, score. Someone uploaded it where you can actually browse through it, but you can't actually read it because it's too dense in the images and high enough quality. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, and percussion is still counting measures, so fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Always counting bars. Just counting bars. Cool. Apparently, there's an ongoing debate over whether he intends people to play it accurately. Mm. <laughs> because it seems kind of impossible. Anyway. I had like a similar-ish experience this week re-listening to, I forget the artist, but it's Threnody for the Victims of Hiroshima. Oh, uh, Penderecki. Yeah. Dude, that is fucking great. I was just thinking about episode eight of Twin Peaks, The Return, and so yep. it's just re-listening to it. There's a story behind that, that originally Penderecki wrote it, and I think it was called like number 14. Mm -hmm. And the publisher was like, no one's going to buy this thing. <laughs> we need a better title. And I believe the publisher, I forget who the publisher was, suggested the title. And Penderecki was like, whatever, I don't care, fine. <laughs> and it's like super iconic. It's like the best title of all time. Yeah, you it know? is. But it literally had nothing to do with the composing of it. That's wild because it's <laughs> such an apt 
thing. It's perfect. I so rarely have like a strong physical response to music, but that's one where it's just like, it takes so many unexpected, like interesting turns in it. And like by the end of it, you just feel kind of like, oh. That score is amazing. You ever seen that score? Yeah. With the, it's just the, it's just the black, black lines, lines yeah. and like select any tone in this oh, area shit. and just saw the shit out of your instrument. You know, I've been in a lot of academic institutions. I will always go to the classical library, take out one of those big, stupid, oversized scores by like Ligeti or Zanakis or whoever. Yes. And I just flip through these things, which are like, it's like a two foot by three foot book yeah. because it's for some crazy ensemble and some weird notation. And they are these works of art. Terry Riley scores are like this too, of course. Mm-hmm. John Cage, his early stuff. Yeah. Before he really got sort of off the reservation, but there's some beautiful, beautiful John Cage things because his penmanship is just extraordinary. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you can see the creation of the score being as much of a work of art as the actual performance. And I think at least for Cage, probably you could argue that the score was more important than whatever sounds you made from it anyway, sometimes. Yeah, depends sort of which era of his. Because he has these beautiful through-composed pieces early on where he's dealing with the prepared stuff. and Yeah. And then he, once he does four minutes and 33 seconds, the importance shifts in terms of the things. But... Mm. Love that. That whole era, can you imagine being alive then, like, you know, like from 50 to 75 or something, like right around there? Like, yeah. Just how drastic a change yeah. occurred, you know, with everything where you had, you know, not only the Beatles and doing all their stuff, but then you had Terry Riley and Zanakis and like all these Zappa, like, yeah, hanging yeah. out Zappa, having coffee together in New York. I always wish I was at those, like the Rite of Spring or the Steve Reich Four Organs premiere where people like start screaming and they're like, make it stop, yep. you know? And this apparently kind of happened with this Fernie Ho piece as well. And the premiere, the audience fucking hated it. Yeah. And people lost their minds. They always do. The Rite of Spring was always the go-to story. Whenever you hear about riots, like at a hip hop show or something. Yeah, yeah. Wait, really? Yeah, in 1913, he premieres this piece in Paris. With the ballet, and it's a whole... Yeah, the full ballet, and people went ape shit. They were like tearing <laughs> seats out of the theater. They were going so crazy. It sounded like it was written last week, this piece. You know, it's still to this day, the Rite of Spring still sounds just crazy. Well, and it's like... Bah, 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 bah. Yeah, and then polytonal and atonal, and then rhythmically imprecise and the whole thing. And 1913... Yeah. It's insane that this guy, that Stravinsky pulled this out of his ass, you know, and then it was played pretty accurately, apparently. And and yeah, and people just went nuts. Like, this is the end of the world. What has the 20th century wrought? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, yeah. No wonder two world wars are coming. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I forgot this is in uh, ye old Fantasia. Yeah, which apparently had the dinosaurs, which apparently Stravinsky hated. Really? Yeah. (laughs) It's not about dinosaurs. <laughs> I was talking about, do you know the Ebony Concerto by Stravinsky? No. It's a piece for big band that Stravinsky wrote, and he wrote it for Woody Herman on clarinet. Oh my gosh, I've never heard of this. You got to listen to it. It's great. My big band in college performed it, and we got a guest clarinet soloist. And apparently there was some article that came out at the time which called it a collaboration between Stravinsky and Woody Herman, and he mm. lost his mind. <laughs> he was like, it's not a collaboration. And I wrote it for, how dare those assholes called? It's like, dude, at this point, you're like the preeminent composer of the 20th century. Like, maybe just calm down, you know. Anyway, okay, we should move on to our next segment, Layton. Yes. So our final segment is called Peaches and Lemons. Here's the theme song. Peaches and Lemons. Peaches and Lemons. There it is. That was it. It's part gratitude exercise, part airing of a petty grievance. So we will each start with a lemon, which is a minor inconvenience. And then we will move on to peaches, where we'll each do three, which are good, fun, exciting, big, small, just nice stuff. So lemons, can I start? (laughs) (laughs) I know your lemon, yes. Okay, my lemon is that my Instagram and Twitter got hacked yesterday. Oh, no. And Instagram support and Twitter support are absolute dog shit. And I want to punch somebody because no avenue has been helpful. This person changed my Instagram handle, changed all of the two-factor authentication, changed the email, the phone number immediately on everything. Did you have two-factor on and they changed that? Like they managed to get through that? I think I didn't have it on like a fucking idiot. And now they're DMing everyone on my follow list offering uh you can buy this account for two hundred and fifty dollars in crypto 
This is not a Tyler Durden thing. This is not you in a fugue state <laughs> doing this at some point. Yeah, it turns out my alter ego is yeah. Darwin27K, which is what they changed my <laughs> oh, username Jesus. to. And then additionally, and I really appreciate this, but I had everyone text me, message me, Discord. Late in your account got hacked. And so as I have like 50 tabs open trying to fix this, I keep getting the notifications. And I'm like, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I appreciate it, but I know. <laughs> so it's been a very fun 24 hours and I would love for... Twitter and Instagram to get off their asses and fucking let me back in because now I'm terrified about them deleting shit or posting shit or whatever. So, yeah. It's fun. It's fun. How many followers do you have? Like, what are you set to lose if this doesn't work out? It's about 30,000 on both. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well. Yeah. And a decade on both accounts. Yes. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. I'm sorry. So that's my lemon. Someone else lemon. Okay. Mine's a lot smaller scale. Yeah, mine was like a questionable lemon. <laughs> My lemon is just that we have a, not a direct neighbor, but a neighbor who's kind of in the neighborhood who's just been creepily driving up and down the street, driving <laughs> up and down the street. It's like a probably lady in her 60s or 70s, driving up, driving down. I have a theory. Yes. The CD player in the car is the only CD player that she has left that works. <laughs> and she's just listening to stuff. And she's listening to books on tape that her niece and nephew got her uh -huh. okay. for her birthday last year. She's got Oprah Volume 2 right. on 15 CDs. She's just got to hear it all. She's got to hear it all. And that's the only way. You know, I'm going to choose to believe this. <laughs> We know she, she's gotten into it with another one of our neighbors. This is the one in the first episode of this podcast I was talking about where the crazy lady was tossing peanuts into the backyard. <gasps> is that lady? Of the kid that had a <laughs> peanut allergy. Oh, my God. Child murder and other awkward situations. Yeah, tossing peanuts into this yard. And then the people were like, are you fucking throwing peanuts in our yard? And she's like, <laughs> no, they fell from a tree. <laughs> it's like, they don't grow that way. And also, you're trying to kill our son. So wait, the peanut thrower is the lady in the car or she got into it with the peanut thrower? No, no, she's the lady in the car or her boyfriend or something. Put some peanuts in the tailpipe. See what, see how that does. Yeah. <laughs> What's the Beverly Hills cop line? You never thought I'd fall for the peanuts in the tailpipe. <laughs> so anyway, the family that was there with the allergic kid has moved out. A new family has moved in and is not happy with their lives right now because they have this insane neighbor that just hates them and is, I think, trying to scope them out and the other people on the block too. So What the anyway, fuck? It's a minor lemon for us because luckily she hasn't gotten into our stuff at all. We just see her harassing this one family and mm. they asked us to write a letter to support them with a restraining order, which we did. Like, Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. It's like a whole thing. That sucks. Wow. Yeah. Uh, George, you got a lemon? I do. I, I do want to share yours, Leighton. I feel for you. <laughs> Thank you. I live in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. It's a lovely, lovely town. Thursdays, uh, we have a thing called uh, Tunes at Twilight, which used to be just a single location concert that would happen early in the evening. But because of COVID, they spread it out so that every restaurant now has a musician or duo or trio in front of it playing on the street outside. So you can walk around town. You go from restaurant to restaurant. You grab a cocktail. You listen to some music. And it's quite a lovely thing. This happens Thursdays from like six to nine o'clock. Now I live right across the street from the Twisted Olive. It's a lovely place. I know the owner, he and his wife, they run the place. Chef Steve, he's a wonderful guy. Because this is happening every Thursday through the summer, a lot of the same duos and trios are kind of playing. And this last Saturday, there was a duo across the street that had been here two weeks previous. And they played the same set <laughs> that they had played. Two weeks previous, not just the same like tunes, but like the same order of the same <laughs> tunes so that all the little segues that they would do from tune to tune where they start playing some song that went into tequila. It's like you're doing the tequila segue again. It just reminded me how, for the most part, I just hate musicians. <laughs> For the percentage of cool musicians versus the percentage of musicians that are not cool, it's like all of them. It's kind of like you hear stories of Nazis that like tried to help Jews during World War II. And like that might have happened, but you still hate Nazis. Yeah. <laughs> and I think the percentages are pretty spot on. I'm fortunate that I've surrounded myself with musicians that are wonderful and are great. But when you think of the actual aggregate, the musicians are just terrible. Just again, yeah. going back to our previous, you know, like, why would you not think? 
It's the same audience, like the same venue in the same place. Yeah. Hold on. I, I have the perfect visual aid for this that I have in my apartment. One moment. <laughs> <laughs> there we Indeed. Go. That's pretty great. For audio only, it's a little sign that says artists for cowards. <laughs> well, I guess it, it is relevant. My jazz mentor in college just had a rule in his jazz class. No guitarists. It's <laughs> a good rule. Yep. He was like, sorry, if you can really prove to me that you can read music, maybe I'll consider it. Otherwise, I'm sorry, you can't take this class, guitarist. Now, again, the guitarist that's in the Philadelphia Funk Authority, Andy, is unbelievably great. He is the quietest guitarist I've ever worked with. Plus, he can play jazz brilliantly. He's happy to play an E7 chord for six minutes great. if that's what the song requires. <laughs> but... There was another duo that was here. It was bass and guitar and vocals. And the bass player is this nice guy, but he's just one of these, when he's doing his sound check, like here is every note that I learned uh -huh. yeah, over yeah, the yeah. course of my life. <laughs> sound check, right? I'm checking the sound. And here's four minutes of every sort of progressive scale I can possibly play at whatever <laughs> impossible tempo I could possibly do. Here you go. <laughs> then they start playing the song and they play Margaritaville. It's like, <laughs> I, like, like, I understand, I understand appealing the crowd. I get it. I get having repertoire that is appealing. There are a trillion songs that are more than three chords that crowds would love to hear. Yeah. But that just, oh, I'm going to play Margarita because, eh, you know, it's easy. As a bassist, this is offensive to me. Like, yeah. there's so many so that actually have good bass lines and that everybody loves. Just play those. I know. I personally think of Jimmy Buffett as prog. Yeah. We need to move on yeah. from this, Brian. <laughs> yeah. It causes me to progress out of the room. Yes. All right. Peaches. So we're each going to share three peaches. I will just start yeah. real quick. I'm going to blast through these. I have a college friend who's in town. I haven't seen this. My roommate in Boston when I moved there after grad school. Lived with him for a few years in colleges. Just one of my oldest, dearest friends. He's from LA and he's back in town and he's arriving at my house in five minutes. So I'm excited to see him today. Next, Peach. I had a lovely Asahi bowl this morning, mm. which is not something I usually indulge in because I can't stand all the bullshit marketing around them, but uh, <laughs> they, they taste pretty good. It's just like a smoothie in a bowl, right? Well, it's like this acai paste with fruit and granola on top of it. A paste is, that makes it sound more, it's like a frozen smoothie is, is a better way of saying it, with fruit and maybe some granola on top of it. It's like a slurry. Thank you. Like a chum. And the other is that for whatever reason, I've been doing a couple like Instagram live things recently just to kind of try it out. I feel like I'm, going to try to do more streaming-ish stuff. They're fun. They're really fun. It's just like a little, I don't want to do anything except just hang out and talk to people, answer questions, that sort of stuff. Do the uh, two-step authentication yes, thing, you. though. Be sure to do that, though, because yeah. I've heard stories of people <laughs> that, uh, yeah, got totally screwed. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Layton, you should try to get on your Instagram uh, later and, and do a do a live stream. The only one that I have access to is my dog's Instagram account. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those are my peaches. Lovely. George? My first peach is panko breadcrumbs. Fuck yeah. Pretty great. Right? Yes. I mean, panko breadcrumbs are just outstandingly great. You got your savory uses. I just made a lovely breaded piece of pork the other day. Mm -hmm. It's so simple, so good, but you can do sweet. You can do like a fried ice cream thing. For sure. You know, it's like, couldn't be simpler. Sometimes you do the egg wash and you add the thing. Maybe you do the flour and then the egg and then the panko. But... Not necessarily. I've just done straight wet meat with panko, and it works great. Sorry, that's the episode title, Straight Wet Meat. Straight Wet Meat. Okay. <laughs> Love it. Breadcrumbs are fine. It's not the same. It's not the yep. same. It's eating like delicious sand. <laughs> I want to be on that beach. Yes. I want to visit that planet. Whatever episode of Rick and Morty that is that has a panko-based beach. I'm not a beach person, but I would spend a week there easily, easily sitting on a chair. Oh, and it's so good on like a little fried fish with a little squirt of lemon on it. Like, phew. Anything. You know, you put it on an avocado. You do like a faux yeah. fried avocado. <gasps> fried goat cheese is a really uh, good one. If you're making a salad and you throw some fried goat cheese on it, ooh. Panko. Can't beat it. That's the first one. The second one was, um, this just occurred to me that I think my favorite comedic line and the best written line of all time is a two-line exchange between two characters in a movie where the one character says, who lives in that castle over there? And the second character says, I'm 37. 
Now, this, of course, is from the Monty Python's Holy Grail. Mm -hmm. That exchange fills my heart with pudding because it's so perfect on every level. It is both absolutely absurdist and absolutely realist at the same time. Because the scene is King Arthur's trying to figure out who their lord is. And this peasant who King Arthur has misidentified as an old woman, he says old woman, and the guy says man. He's like, oh, sorry, man, who was in that castle? Who was in that castle over there? And he says, I'm 37. So he's saying, not only am I not a woman, I'm a man, right? And not only am I not old, I'm 37. But in whatever it is, it's nine words, it's 11 words, whatever it is, they completely encapsulate the ethos of not just Monty Python, but absurdist humor, literal humor, silliness. It is so brilliant and it never fails to floor me. Not even just hear it. Whenever I think about that line, who lives in that castle over there? I'm 37. That entire scene, I constantly am thinking about help, help, I'm being oppressed. Being repressed. And yeah. also, I like when they go into that scene, the job that the peasants are doing is just hitting water with sticks. <laughs> yeah. There's a lovely patch of filth over here. Yeah. Supreme executive power comes from a mandate from the masses, not from some farce aquatic ceremony. If you want to wield supreme executive power, yeah, it's a perfect sketch. Those lines in particular, too, you know, the thing that's important to one person, King Arthur, he makes this offhanded remark about the person's identity. And then the person he's trying to get information from is so offended at this slight yeah. that they can't let it go. No, I'm still back on the fact that you think I'm old. Exactly. The distillation of the writing, too. It's just all protein. You know, yeah. <laughs> who lives in that castle over there? And he could have said, wait a minute, I'm not old, I'm 37, which would suck. Number three for you? My third thing. Another thing that floors me is, and I'm going to show my age here, but I don't give a shit. In the song... What a Fool Believes. Now, Yacht Rock is its own thing. I love it. I didn't growing up. I never liked that kind of 70s, late, early 80s, again, cocaine-based yes. studio <laughs> musicianship. But I have a tremendous affinity for it now. Same. Hated it growing up. Love it now. One of the reasons is because it is both melodically wonderful, it's very singable, but harmonically what's happening is so crazily interesting yes. in so many instances. And this is the best example of it in the song, What a Fool Believes by the Doobie Brothers. I just happen to have a guitar here. <laughs> oh my God. By pure coincidence. So this thing happens where there's a B section where they go. As she rises to her penitent, and da 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 Right, lovely yeah. melody. Now, what could they do? They could have done three chords there. They could have been just E flat minor, D, E flat, and then a B, fl B flat minor seven. As she rises to her apology, any other name would surely know. But no, they don't do three chords there. They do nine chords there. So they do an E flat minor nine. She rises to a A flat 13, to a D flat major seven plus nine. Apology to a B69 to a B flat seven back to that E flat E flat minor nine. So instead they do this as she rises to her apology. Anybody else would surely know. That's fucking good. Yeah. It's so good. I'm, I'm butchering it. But, so yeah. Rises to that 13. Right. Her apology, this, this chord, this major seven plus nine. Yeah, that's beautiful. Anybody else would surely know. And then they go to this stage, love is so. And my favorite chord in the whole song. When he goes up. To this G, yeah. G minor seven flat five with an 11, like a diminished kind of thing. Yeah. That's my favorite. Yeah, so. And that's just the B section. That's just yeah. the transitional section going into the chorus. As she rises to her apology, anybody else would surely know. She's watching her go. Why does that work? It works. And it's that, and coupled with the production on it, which is like unbelievable. I mean, the playing's amazing. The production's great. The groove. The groove is unparalleled. Yeah, the timbre of all the stuff, the instruments. And then, yeah, and they're using probably maybe 16 or maybe 24 track. Yeah. You know, and they're playing. None of it is being fixed in Pro Tools. None of it is being, and then the vocals are just insane. And yeah, those are my three. 
Beautiful. My three peaches are number one, it's nice to uh, walk my dog without a mask on. Like that's been really nice. I never really like encounter many people when I go on walks anyway, but like I've been so militant about masking this entire year, like afraid to take it off once ever. So it's kind of refreshing. I'm surprised the dog wears a mask. That was great. Yeah, you know, she gets really upset because she can't sniff dog butts as <laughs> strongly with the mask. I hear you. The worst part of COVID. Yes. <laughs> Not being able to sniff dog butts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my second peach is that I went to my first party since everything, which was really wild. It was Ross's birthday and it was just lovely. And, you know, I got a joint circle going and was like, had that moment where I was like, Yes. Okay. We did it. We're here. I just love that I immediately went back to my party persona, which is shoving joints on everyone and then being like, hey, you guys want to hear some fucked up true crime shit? And then my third peach is that since we're going into the new world, I was going to get one of those little like InstaX Polaroid cameras to have like physical photos of people because it would also be nice to go a place and give them a picture. And instead... I found a little portable photo printer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, those are rad. Yes, and it prints it on sticker paper automatically, and it's there's no ink. It's just like thermal, whatever the hell it is. Now I'm obsessed with it and can't stop printing pictures. So those are my three. I love it. George, thank you so much for being here today. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, no, thanks for letting me go on and on about nothing. No, it was fabulous. It's my brand. <laughs> is there anything you want to plug or where can people find you, et cetera, et cetera? Oh, geologicpodcast.com is is fine. The stock line is that if you put my last name, which is Harab, H-R-A-B, into Google, the first 86,000 things are me. So. <laughs> and I mean, talk about, you are a veteran podcaster. You're in episode 700? 718. God damn. How many years is that? 12 years, yeah. Going wow. on 13. It's amazing. This is a year and a half, right, for us now, Leighton, something like that? Yeah. yeah. Very strange. Good for you. Well, congrats to you for doing it. What's your demo? So who are we talking to here? Actually, you know what? A thing that I love when I look at the Spotify breakdown is that we have a lot of non-binary friends who listen to this podcast, which I think is really amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. It's also like a bunch of dudes in their 30s, apparently. I'd say generally it's pretty young, under 40 for sure, probably bimodal with humps around like late teens and late 20s. Like 18 to 24. I had humps in my late teens. Boy, that was <laughs> good times. And yeah, the audience is really great. I think it's pretty queer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So there is an interesting split that I think about that there is a big silent portion of listeners who don't interact, which is why I'm always surprised when I see like men in their 30s. But the people who actively engage with the show and with me on social media is like very largely like queer folks who I'm imagining probably had an in with me from Dream Daddy, if I had to guess. Yeah, which is the game that Leighton created, George. It's a dating sim for dads. Oh, okay. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. But yeah, regardless, all of you out there, thanks for listening to the show, regardless of your demo. I've convinced myself that my demo is just one of those, the silent, non-interactive, because yeah. I get no emails <laughs> and no suggestions or anything. All right, everyone, go email George. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I get wonderful emails. We have a Discord for the show, too, which being part of the Patreon lets you be a part of the Discord. Didn't intend for that to be a plug, but it basically is. And then that Discord is honestly the part of the community that we see the most. Okay. So that's the vocal part that Leighton's talking about. It's a lovely group of people. Wonderful. Uh, I remember yeah. Jesse Thorne from Max Fun one time saying that most communities are just a bunch of whiny babies, but <laughs> <laughs> his is not and ours is not either. I mean, that's a true statement. Yeah. Not about you all. You all are wonderful, but in general. Right. Like musicians. Yes. It's that same kind of thing. Yeah. Or artists. Every other Friday, I do a YouTube thing called Seven Songs, which I do seven songs on a theme. Like, you know, every title is going to have the word one in it, or this is all songs. The covers are more famous than the originals or whatever. I remember you did one that songs that start with the chorus. Songs that start with the chorus. Yeah. I did a songs with great bridges. This last episode was Billy Joel, songs by Billy Joel. So fun. But what's developed and what's been this wonderful, unexpected thing because of the whole COVID deal. And as a performer, is to have the live chat running while you're performing. Because live, when you're performing, people talking to each other is the most annoying thing in the world. I mean, you're especially a small venue. Even if they're enjoying the performance, it can be distracting. Whereas here, in the virtual environment, to have this sort of lovely chat running at the same time, speaking of a lovely community, this 
every other Friday night George concert community has sort of, they have their own emojis that they're using now. Like whenever they like a song, they put potatoes for some reason. I don't even know why. It's like <laughs> this whole little subculture for seven songs has developed and it's really, really wonderful. So like people come and they know, okay, these 30, 40 people are going to be in the chat and they're going to be you know, talking to each other while I'm doing it, but it's not distracting and yet it adds to the whole experience. It's a very unexpected little bonus that this kind of virtual thing has developed, which is kind of cool. Yeah, totally. Lovely. All right, everyone. Thank you for being here for yet another episode of Late Night. As always, take care, stay safe, and come hard. All right, that's the end of the podcast. Goodbye. <laughs> Late Night is produced by Brian Wecht, Leighton Gray, and Jarek Centeno. Follow us on Twitter at Leighton Night, on Instagram at Leighton underscore night, or email us at Leighton at gmail.com.